This Lcast is recorded in front of a live streaming audience. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Cellcast. Joining me today is a man who just got a hankering for triple mint gum. Welcome, Jacob. And you just can't get the flavor out. It's just ridiculous, man. Anyways, why thank you. Let me do sorry, our co-host. A man who, oh my gosh, if, if, if I hear another thing about hockey, I might go kapuk over it. Welcome, Drew. The funny thing is, is I don't even like hockey. It's fun. I'm sure it is. Yeah, definitely the live games. Oh my gosh. Stadium. Oh my gosh. Go do it. It's awesome. But you're talking to a man who's only, the only sport he actually can follow is baseball. Huh. Because I really can't follow the other games. Well, hockey's a lot more kinetic. <laughs> if you're talking about the fact that every once in a while it breaks out into a game of hockey when it's normally just fighting. No, it's not. <laughs> it, it's, hockey is a lot more than just people throwing punches on the ice. I know, but that's the joke. <laughs> that, yeah, I know. A I know good game of hockey is a, is a giant fight that yeah. every once in a while breaks out and people in, in, in a boom. Those people, you know what I mean? Yes. Anywho. <laughs> Yes, tonight we are reviewing the Disney Pixar film Inside Out, which mm-hmm. many claim was the last good Pixar film. Is it? I'm trying to think what besides uh, Onward came out after this that uh, might qualify. Well, for tur- that. Turning Red was good. Turning Red, yes. But I mean, that's. I, I mean, between COVID and this. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Disney Pixar Disney hey, good is, Dinosaur was in there and I like Good Dinosaur yeah but Good I, Dinosaur was different I'll admit it's not you know the best it's not everybody's cup of tea though yeah it, the fact that it came out the same year as this movie kind of did not help it any no but I can't think of what other Pixar films came out at this time I'm drawing a blank except I think this is when Cars 3 came out Ugh. but we haven't touched any Cars movies yet so we'll worry we'll get there when we get there exactly so yeah, are you ready to jump into our spoiler-free thoughts on this? Exactly. Let's do this. The alleged <sighs> certified fresh and spoiler-free. I haven't seen this film since it came out in theaters, and it's not Same. because it's a bad film. I think it's just there's so much to watch that uh, this one has, I just haven't touched in a while. Uh, but I did enjoy it. It's uh, probably one of the most creative Pixar movie to come out in the last couple of years, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I mean, it's it's a good, fun movie. I have a couple of issues we'll get to later on, but other yeah, it's definitely one to watch. I I, I can't really tell, talk much more about it than that without getting into it, right? Uh, I'm in the same boat with you, True. Yeah, like the last time I really sat down and actually watched this film was actually in theaters. Mm-hmm. And again, I was blown away by the, the storytelling and the characters and the whole bit. And uh, watching it again be like I'm sitting there as a, a, an adult man in at 40 and sitting there and be like by the end of the film, I'm choking up. How good, how good emotionally stirring this movie is. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I enjoy this movie tremendously, and I'm going to look, I'm looking forward to uh, going into our likes and dislikes. All right. In that instance, why don't we? Yeah. The following is a spoiler filled review for the movie Inside Out. Listener discretion is advised. Inside Out was written and directed by Pete Docter, who also directed Monsters Incorporated, mm-hmm. and Ronnie Del Carmen, who directed seven episodes of the television series Freakazoid. Hmm. A show I've never seen before. I'm going to have to torture you with that one. Right, right. I actually like Freakazoid. I think uh, you'll like it too, but it is definitely a crazy television show. Of course. It was also written by Meg LaFoe, Josh Cooley, Michael Arndt, and Simon Rich. Hmm. Getting into the cast, Amy Poehler plays Joy, Mm -hmm. and she's most famous for playing Leslie Knopp in uh, Parks and Recreation. Phyllis Smith plays Sadness, and uh, she played Phyllis Vance in The Office. I'm guessing you don't know any of these things. Nope. No idea. Here's one you'll know. Bill Hader was the voice of Fear, 
And in the 2017 Power Rangers movie, he was Alpha 5. That's right. He was like, Like, gosh. (laughs) Uh, Lewis Black plays Anger, and apparently he played Santa Claus on SpongeBob SquarePants. (laughs) Really? Yeah. That's hilarious. And Mindy Kaling was the voice of Disgust, and she was the cause of the television show that must not be named. Yes. Elma. Yeah. Runner of Scooby Doo. Yeah. Where's the real Ran? Please, guys, go back and fix that. Please. Uh, Richard Kind <laughs> was the voice of Bing Bong, and uh, he was Monty in Tangled the Series, aka Rapunzel's villain. That's not the was um, Monty? Monty. Uh, enemy. And Rapunzel's enemy. enemy. That was the yeah. episode. Yeah, very interesting episodes. Right. Go back and listen to those. Uh, Caitlin Diaz was the voice of Riley. Mm-hmm. And uh, in something called a very special episode, she played a character named Catherine. And I could not figure out what any this what, what this show was. It was just the only thing. It was the top of her most well-known for besides in this movie. Really? She just doesn't have that much else to pick from. Okay. Diane Lane was the voice of Mom. And uh, she was Martha Kent in the DC uh, Extended Universe. That's right. She is. Kyle McLaughlin played Dad, and in the television series Twin Peaks, he played Dale Cooper. I think the that's the main investigator. Okay. There again, I never saw Twin Peaks. And because this is still in the era where Pixar still like John Ratzenberger. Mm-hmm. Sad. I do wonder if Nat, since John Ratzenberger almost never shows up in these things, that he was considered their lucky rabbit's foot. Mm-hmm. If that's why their movies aren't, aren't doing as that well could be. It's probably just coincidence, but true. Still, Pixar just rehire him. Yes, Bring, and he, mend the bridges, get him back. And he, he was uh, mm-hmm. Cliff Clavin, of course, in Cheers. Yes, and among many other things like Ham and mm-hmm. Toy Story. And yes, something in every Pixar movie. Kingdom Hearts Connections. Guess how many we have? Uh, this is a 2017? Yes. I would probably guess more like six. You're one off. Up or down? Up. Okay. Seven. Seven. Okay. We've got Keith Ferguson as additional voices in this movie, and Mar- he played Marluxia in Kingdom Hearts. Greg Berger, who was additional voices in this movie, mm-hmm. and was Eeyore. In Kingdom Hearts. Uh-huh. Of course, John Ratzenberger, who was Fritz in this movie. Mm-hmm. And uh, he played Ham in Kingdom Hearts. Carlos Alizraki. My apologies if I spelled that wrong. He was the helicopter pilot and dad's fear in Inside Out. I.e. the Brazilian helicopter pilot. Yeah. That, my that the mother's uh, emotions really liked yeah that and uh, he played mike wazowski in kingdom hearts patrick seitz was additional voices in here and he additional voices in kingdom hearts mary gibbs play was additional voices in here do you know what she is most famous for mary gibbs yes i've heard that even it's uh monsters incorporated okay she played boo oh okay so when she was, what, two years old, she yeah. did that role? Yeah. And uh, they used her archival audio from that in Kingdom Hearts. Oh, okay. For Boo in that movie. Okay. For that game. And Brett Book, sorry, Brett Brooke Parker, who played the bad actress in this movie, mm-hmm. in the uh, dream sequence. Yeah. Dream, uh, yeah. She was the trailer mom in Kingdom Hearts, i.e. they did, they showed one of the scenes, you know, from Monsters Incorporated yeah. where... Uh, uh, oh, what is the purple monster's name? Uh, that's the villain in Monsters Incorporated. Um, uh, that's a good question. You know, they, they, uh, sh- they, he shows up in the trailer, and they go, and, and he goes, and, and, so, and it's obviously somewhere in uh, the boonies in Louisiana. It says, "Mom, an alligator's got inside the trailer again." <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that character. Ah. <laughs> That's who I'm talking about. That's who she played in Kingdom Hearts. Oh, okay. I got Not you. the same line, but it's meant to be that same moment. Yeah. What do we got in info and stuff? Info and stuff. So let me get to my notes real fast. Come on. There we go. All right. So info and stuff. Uh, IMDb has an 8.1 out of 10. 
to be able to watch on Disney Plus if you subscribe to Disney Plus or if you have the Blu-ray or DVD or mm-hmm. Ultra HD, whatever. Uh, production was Walt Disney Pictures and Pixar Animated Studios, distributed by Walt Disney Studios Motion Pictures. Release date, where do you think it was first viewed on May 18th, 2015? Not 2017, like I said before, but 2015. Where was this movie first viewed? Roman's Chinese Theater. Eh, wrong. Guess again. It's still somewhere in L- L.A. Hmm. It's the closest I'm going to get. Is that Cannes unless- Film Festival. Okay, it was it Cannes? Mm-hmm. I don't remember where Cannes is. I don't remember either, but we're going to move I think forward. think it's in France. Anyway. Yeah. Anyways, uh, so it premiered state um, throughout the United States on June 19th of the same year. Going into box office, it had as many budget, but $175 million. Uh, its opening weekend for the United States was $90.4 million on June 21st. It's uh, U.S. gross in Canada gross was $357.9 million, and its uh, global gross is $858.8 million. Okay. Uh, home release, Inside Out, was released on digital download on October 15th. This was followed by a DVD and DVD and Blu-ray following that November. Physical copies contained behind-the-scenes featurettes, audio commentaries, deleted scenes, and two shorts, uh, Lava and Riley's First Date. If you haven't seen Riley's First Date, it's actually kind of funny. So, highly recommend Lava's going. Lava's good, too. Lava's really good, too. Uh, don't get me wrong. That's really good. Because uh, I watched this last, like, late last night because me and Drew had a really good conversation after Bible study. Mm-hmm. And I got home late and watched it. And it was like, you know what? This is nine minutes, so this ain't gonna take long. So yeah, it's it's worth it's it's probably maybe like four minutes, four or five minutes. It's worth your time. Go watch it. And Lava is really good too. Um, all right, uh, home media release was a success, uh, being the best-selling home release in November, and the number five rental back in the day there was rentals. Uh, during its release week, about 57% of its sales were on Blu-ray, a 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray uh, version was released in 2019. The physical release has earned about $97.8 million by 2015. Mm-hmm. Sequels, because they just can't leave good movies alone. So, a sequel titled Inside Out 2, surprise, surprise, and nobody. It may get another name closer we get to release. Yeah, right. Like Inside Out, the sequel. Maybe. They're actually making a, they're actually it, making, they're actually making a series. That doesn't surprise me. Yeah. Of course, uh, if we know. It's, I would say it would be about puberty, except I looked through the IMDb list to see if the same, when I was doing the cast list to see... Oh, surely these people are coming back for the sequel. Mm-hmm. None of the uh, Riley is not in the sequel, from what I can tell. Mm, not yet. Got to place the setting somewhere in there. That is true. Uh, let's see. It has been announced to be in development for June fourteenth, two thousand fourteen release. The film will follow Riley as a teenager with a new set of personal personalized emotions. Um, Amy, how do you pronounce her last name? Polar? Polar. Yeah, Pola. Amy Polar will prize her, um, her royal as Joy, while Mandy Keeling and Bill Hader mm-hmm. uh, will not return as discussed in fear, uh, following reports of a contract dispute on June 20, on June 2020, uh, doctor confirmed that uh, Doctor had confirmed that Sadness will return to the film uh, series. A television series based on Inside Out is being developed by Pixar. Soul and Luca writer Mike Jones will be developing the series. So that's all I have for info and stuff. All right, getting into the summary. 
Within the mind of a young girl named Riley are the basic emotions that control her actions. Joy, sadness, fear, disgust, and anger. Her experiences become memories stored as colored orbs, which are sent into long-term memory each night. The aspects of more five most important core memories within her personality incorporate the form of five floating islands. Joy acts as leader, and she and the rest of the emotions try to limit Sadness's influence. At the age of 11, Riley moves from Minnesota to San Francisco for her father's new job. At first, she has poor experiences. The new house is cramped and old. Her father hardly had any time for her due to him needing to set up his new job. A local pizza parlor only serves pizza topped with your favorite topping, Jacob Broccoli, blah, which she dislikes. And the moving van with their belongings was misdirected to Texas. On, Riley, on Riley's first day at her new school, sadness retroactively turns joyous memories sad, which causes Riley to cry in front of her class and creates a sad core memory. Joy tries to dispose of it using a vacuum tube, but accidentally knocks the other core memories loose during a struggle with sadness, disabling the personality islands. Joy's sadness and the core memories are sucked out of the headquarters. In Joy and Sadness's absence, anger, fear, and disgust are forced to take control of Riley and try to make happy core memories, but the results are disastrous, distancing Riley from her parents, friends, and hobbies. Without the core memories, her personality islands gradually crumble and fall into the memory dump where things fade to non-existence as they are forgotten. Finally, anger resolves to run away to Minnesota, believing it will restore Riley's happiness. While navigating the, the vast long-term memory area, Joy and Sadness encounter Bing Bong, Riley's imaginary friend who suggests riding the train of thought back to headquarters. After several adventures and mishaps, the trio finally catch the train. However, it halts when Riley falls asleep, then derails entirely with the collapse of another island. Afraid that all of the core memories will become sad, Joy abandons Sadness and tries to ride a recalled tube back to headquarters. The ground below the tube collapses, breaking it and sending Joy and Bing Bong plunging into the memory dump. After discovering a sad memory turned happy when Riley's parents and friends confronted her, Joy understands Sadness's purpose of alerting others when Riley is emotionally overwhelmed and needs help. Joy and Bing Bong try to use Bing Bong's chant, a song-fueled wagon rocket to escape the memory dump. They fall they fail to fully ascend due to their combined weight until Bing Bong jumps out of at the last moment and fades away. Joy reunites with Sadness and they return to headquarters, discovering that Anger's idea has disabled the console, putting Riley in depression as she boards a bus to Minnesota. To the surprise of others, Joy hands control of the console to Sadness, who is able to reactivate it and prompt Riley to return to her parents. As Sadness reinstalls the core memories, transforming them from happy to sad, Riley tearfully uh, confesses to her parents that she misses her old life. Her parents comfort her and admit that they also miss Minnesota. Joy and Sadness work the console together, creating a new core memory consisting of happiness and sadness. A new island forms representing Riley's acceptance of her new life in San Francisco. A year later, Riley, now at the age of 12, has adapted to her new home, made new friends, and returned to her old hobbies after acquiring a few new ones. Inside headquarters, her emotions admire Riley's new personality islands and are given a newly expanded console with room for them all to work together. Getting into the trivia for this, according to director Peter Doctor, each emotion is based on a shape. Joy is based on a star, sadness a teardrop, mm -hmm. anger a fire brick, fear a raw nerve, and disgust is broccoli. There. He noted that he hates broccoli, that he likes broccoli very much, however. What is wrong with this person? <laughs> Some of the memory balls in Riley's mind contain scenes from other Pixar movies, such as Carl and Ellie's wedding in Up. 2009, which we still need to review. Yes. The writers considered up to 27 different emotions, but settled on uh, the five of joy, sadness, disgust, fear, and anger to make it less complicated. Some of the major emotions that ended up being cut include surprise, pride, and trust. Yeast of Eden is based on a bake, which is the, uh, the pizza place, mm. uh, is based on a bakery located near Pixar Studios. It only serves one kind of pizza each day, and broccoli is one of the toppings. Mm. When Pete Doctor and Jonas Riviera pitched the idea to the pitch the film to Mindy Kaling, she was moved to tears and said, I think it's great that you guys are making a film that shows it's difficult to grow up and that it's okay to be sad about it. According to Pete Doctor, they then exclaimed, Quick, write that down. Good idea. Director Pete Doctor has said that Bing Bong's voice actor, Richard Kind, was actually crying while recording the line, take her to the moon for me, okay? 
Kind later admitted to this. Also, the cast and crew reportedly cried while recording the scene. In the course of the film, Joy experiences all five of the basic emotions. Joy being her overall demeanor, anger at Sadness's actions, disgust towards Riley's dream boyfriend, fear towards Jangles the Clown, and finally sadness in the memory dump. Lastly, in the scene where Riley's dream about her new house turns into a nightmare, the music playing in the background is from the Disneyland attraction, The Haunted Mansion. Ah. Hmm. So, what is your first dislike for this? Your first like for this film? Wow, we're going to different parts I of this. Sorry, <laughs> he did. My first like of this film is how the writing is done with psychology and mind, psychology in mind of the mind, the human condition. Uh, mental health is a is a big thing, and uh, I know a lot of. I, I I'm really you know back in the you know back you know twenty years ago, like this idea of mental health wasn't really a thing. But now it's come more to the forefront, and you have a film like this who is expressing mental health. Uh, definitely, when you're dealing with a preteen or a tween, and who would be like for those who all of us have been a preteen at one point, and we're you know those emotions are coming out, we don't know how to control them, and you're just a, like an emotional mess the mm -hmm. entire day. So I remember those days; they weren't fun, and the idea that you that a part of you shifts and it changes. So we, we get that in Riley. It's because Riley is this happy go lucky little kid when she's little, but when she goes into her, her pre adolescence in her preteen years, it's just this emotional change. And you see that I enjoy that because it's mm -hmm. this idea that by like joy and sadness are ejected from headquarters because now it's more these mixed emotions mixed emotion that you don't know what's going to happen next because it's because you're not you're not overwhelmingly joy joyful nor are you overwhelmingly sad so you're just kind of in the funk you're depressed at the time so i enjoy that for the story itself and you have um riley's journey along with the emotions journey of trying to get home or in this case riley's trying to get back to where she's from because she misses everything and the other emotions don't know how to be joy when they should simply be themselves and it doesn't really work well. <laughs> but I enjoy the story for what it is. I enjoy where they go with the mental health. I enjoy with the, the emotional state mm -hmm. of the characters, who they are. They're, they're represented fairly well. Uh, I do have some questioning of why you have so many of one positive emotion and everything else is a negative emotion so i'm just i'm she's I'm, a teenager oh i know that but that's like everybody else in the movie are those five that's, emotions well i mean those are the main ones I, I agreed but i just we'll get there when we get there anyway but i enjoy the i enjoyed the story for what it is it is very well done very well written has you know, like so many depths and layers of like psychology of talking, you know, mm -hmm. within the human mind and what people go through. And I enjoy that. I enjoy that aspect of the film. So it's story. My first like for this film is the visual storytelling. Yes. Your first thought is like, okay, yeah, inside the mind, there's, mm -hmm. uh, there's going to be a lot of, you know, different like imaginative ways of showing things like, yeah. uh, uh, of course you got the imaginary friend, Bing Bong, the, uh, different islands are all kind of abstract, um, designs on, mm. of those concepts, uh, but, and different things like that. But that's mm. not necessarily what I'm referring to. Okay. Even though that is there, I am mainly referring to out in the real world, mm -hmm. especially Riley herself. At the beginning of the film, while she is still, you know, her happy-go-lucky self, primarily through Joy's uh, help, mm -hmm. she is wearing kind of a yellow striped shirt mm -hmm. throughout that part of the thing. After her, uh, as as the scene's going by, you know, everything's bright and cheerful at the beginning mm -hmm. of the film, and she's, like I said, she's wearing that yellow shirt. As the movie continues, and when they first get to the house, everything is gray and dreary and mm -hmm. not the beautiful place they were hoping it was going to be. And then you get to uh, 
and slowly you'll, if you'll notice from the beginning of the film to the end her shirt changes color it starts off as that bright shiny yellow like i said mm-hmm. but when she's on the bus it is gothic black yeah for lack of a better way of describing I it i mean it is pitch black yeah when she's going through her full-on depression mm-hmm. stage yes and the, there's just no, almost there's color on the screen during those scenes mm-hmm. in the but it's all world. washed out it's all life. washed out and dirty and mm-hmm. grungy and very depressing mm-hmm. uh and even the uh scenes that we uh like the hockey rink when she gets angry is all very um and it's obviously looks like a hockey rink and that's like, mm-hmm. i have the feeling of cold but it almost you, it just does you can tell it just does not have visually it does not have the pole it normally would have mm-hmm. for her um and I just appreciate the way they, th- through the visual storytelling during the real life scenes, how they kind of show you what Riley's emotional state is when the irony is we've been following her emotional state far closer with her actual emotions this whole time. But uh, yeah, uh, the creative, uh, the visual storytelling is what I'm, my, this is going to be my first like. Okay. What's your second? My second like would actually be Bing Bong. Bing Bong is a character. Mm-hmm. This character would be like, he pops out of nowhere. We really don't know who he is until like the middle of the film. And he's introduced to who he is and Joy's all excited and be like, oh my gosh, Bing Bong is the, oh, I'm actually recognized by some the the, the prime emotions. It's just like, okay, yeah. I'm actually recognized. Of course but they he, recognize him. He's Riley's imaginary friend. They see exactly, him all the time. Exactly. So you have this you know good be like in a lot of ways it the story kind of leads you to believe that something's going on with bing bong that he's somehow like trying to sabotage things which in truth he's not like he's just trying to help these you know help these two emotions mm-hmm. where he can help riley because obviously he's he is a lost imaginary friend who is not forgotten but still there if he has an ulterior motive, mm-hmm. it is just that he will be remembered again. Yeah, exactly. That's that's the, the primary motivation of him. But because uh, like when you first see him in the film, he's taking memories. He's not going to be like it's not core memories. He's Actually, taking... they refuse you, you. You don't get to see him, but you see a, uh, a connection of to him like really early on in the film when Riley's still a kid because mm-hmm. she's singing his theme song at one point. That's right. That's right. That's right. Just throwing that in there. Yeah, that's right. Be cool like, little continuity thing. True, very true. So, like in the you the the character who is just wanting to be remembered, and I think that's a lot of us in you know so many ways that we want to be remembered. Uh, either we want to remember our childhood, or we want to remember something great. And just like Bing Bong, he wants to be remembered. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then you have the the moment where our characters are thrust into or are are banished to the uh, what do they call that area? The memory dump. The memory dump. The memory dump. And uh, I I love that moment. It's, it's so tear jerking. Mm-hmm. It's such an to you know use the you know the lack of a word emotional. It's an emotional scene where Bing Bong willingly sacrifices himself in order for Joy to get to the the uh, the rim of the dump and it's just this this idea be like he be like be like he doesn't have to continue on as as long as what he did when he was prevalent mm-hmm. prevalent in riley's imagination that be like that's what matters that's what matters and uh because there again i don't think this movie really it'd be like it has a quote-unquote villain but it's not really a villain I don't even know if it's really got a villain. Yeah. I think it's got more. You've got a situation and you've got things that kind of take place. If someone is quote unquote a villain, technically it would be joy. It would be joy, but she comes around. I mean, she does. You're just going to count uh, Mr. Jingles or Jangles, whatever the name of the crime was. (laughs) That was just more. Oh my gosh. And it's like, yeah, be like, I didn't have a fear of clowns. I was more scared of snakes, but, uh, Bear. bear, But I know a lot of people were just terrified, petrified of clowns. So, yeah. But it was just like Bing Bong's arc as a character that he is Riley's childhood imaginary friend. Mm-hmm. And he is willing to sacrifice his existence to be uh, forgotten from Riley's memory in order to 
safeguard Riley's future. And at that point, I'm getting choked up. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Because if we if we take if we extrapolate that and give it more of like a Christian viewpoint, is that what's what Christ did for us? Mm-hmm. Well, when he died on the cross for us, a willing sacrifice and not um like what the world wants to say or be like, oh no, because be like he was he was just a good example. He was a good teacher. No, he was the son of God, came down to earth to um be a living sacrifice for us that we will have eternal life with him through his shed blood. So it's, you know, the, the same, almost the same analogy where Bing Wong gives of his essence, gives of his life, gives of a memory to secure Riley's future, mm-hmm. which we knew, we like, we knew that'd be like, it was a matter of time. We knew what was going to happen at the end of the film, but this emotional, tear jerking moment and I, i'd be like i think we said before that uh pixar really hasn't gone back to this, this like is the last was, time like really good deep storytelling yeah and it's it's sad because like for us who grew up watching pixar watching disney mm-hmm. and uh and now we look at the state of what disney is now hopefully they can you know quote unquote pull themselves up by their bootstraps which you can't but um yeah it's just it's this this amazing this amazing journey of what bing bong does as character it's very well done and yeah it's it's bing bong it's bing bong i love this character i love his design it is so much of a 3 year old 2 year old's imagination yeah it's not even funny but yeah bing bong is my second like My second like is uh, the emotions. Mm. The entire idea of, you know, obviously Joy's in control because she's been in control since the beginning. uh, And she just wants to make her happy. And then poor sadness Mm -hmm. is just there and no one knows what to do with her. Mm -hmm. Anger, they can see how anger has a point. (laughs) They can see how fear has a point. You can see how disgust has a point. And I think the characterizations of uh, all those characters is done very well. Yes. Uh, I especially like how happy anger is. Ooh, let me use the good curse word. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the other thing I like is the fact that um, in all, when we do get to see the emotions mm-hmm. in other people's minds, oh, that's how hilarious. that <laughs> tells you so much about... Uh, who those characters are. Yeah. The dad's uh, main emotion, i.e. the leader, was anger. Mm-hmm. Mom's was sadness. Mm-hmm. We won't talk about the dog or the cat because that was just <laughs> dogs and cats being dogs and cats. Well, I, I would say I would say this when it comes to the emotions of the dogs and cats. The, the dogs are more like, okay, we've got to plan what we're going to do, but it's just a dog. Cat, it's all over the place. <laughs> And the cat's just walking here, walking here, doesn't care. And this, this, the the scene we're referring to is at the end of the movie. Is at the end of the film where the cat just standing there, and then all of a sudden just meow. hilarious. Well, I mean, they started playing with the console, and I've seen. So that was an orange cat, wasn't it? That means it had one brain cell. <laughs> no, it wasn't an orange cat. It was no one. It was a tuxedo. It was a tuxedo cat. Okay, yeah. Never mind. They just cat saw something strange, and that's how the emotions caused it to happen. Yeah. I'm gonna wig out, <laughs> but uh, something. But it's, it's showing you know, all the emotions of the other. My favorite one was uh, the teenage boy talking to Riley. Oh my gosh! And, it, and you can see his brain is broken. They go, it's like it's a girl, it's a girl, it's a girl. We don't know what to do. <laughs> Been there, done that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I love just how you can tell just by looking at who's in charge in these mm-hmm. uh, in these brains. Who it is, and, and plus there's this, a nice little sweet thing. Uh, the moms uh, at the in the early when they are getting right when uh, they're trying to figure out what's wrong, up with Riley before they ground her. Mm-hmm. Um, the back and forth between not the humans necessarily, but the mom's emotions and the dad's emotions, and the mom's emotions get fed up and they just start thinking back to their hot Brazilian pilot. 
from uh, that was perfect. From the thing. That was perfect. But the sweet moment is mm-hmm. they get to the end and the her anger after seeing how sweet the father's being mm-hmm. about the face paint and such, she throws the uh, thing behind. And says, "Eh, we don't need that anymore." Her fear being fear goes and grabs. Just in case. Yeah, just in case. You never know. <laughs> you never know. But yeah, I, I I thought that was sweet, and mm-hmm. I, I just loved how they didn't even have to explain who those emotions were. And the others just like, Oh, that looks like anger, but yet mm. it's uh got a mustache. That's dad. That's mm. dad's anger. So, and so you can just easily tell just by looking at it. And of course the whole thing about putting him, getting him getting ready to put his foot down. Mm-hmm. It's like, as it is, it's like DEF CON two. And we're back. It's like, we're getting mm-hmm. ready to set up an atomic bomb. Oh yeah. <laughs> Which is like, ah, oh, that could have been a disaster. Go over to mom's mind. Well, that was a disaster. <laughs> It's like what were you? What was he thinking? And apparently, everybody has triple mint gums jingle stuck in their heads. <laughs> oh my gosh! Uh, we just send that up whenever uh, we, we yeah. feel like it, mm-hmm. just for the heck of it. But yeah, so yeah, that's my what was that second second like? That's my second like. What's your third? Mine would be Joy's journey. Joy's journey of being be like she's the one she's the one who started Mm -hmm. she's the one who is primarily in control and is so worried that sadness is going to ruin everything and she she's the one who like obviously she's the the emotion she's the the primary primarily primary emotion and it's this has a grip on control and doesn't want to lose control and where sadness does something is, Oh my gosh, you're mm. being an interference. You are being this annoyance. You're, you're ruining everything where it's this journey where be like, they get sucked out of the headquarters into the mem- into the memory banks. And it's just this amazing journey. These two characters who are trying, trying to work together. And mm-hmm. eventually they do wind up, wor- wind up working together and understanding their roles in Riley's life as a character. And where that, that big moment where joy understands that sadness isn't just, um, you want to put her in the back because you don't want to be sad. Mm-hmm. And it's be like that moment where she allows sadness to take control. And what sadness does is allows other people to, you know, be like, Hey, I'm not feeling well. Yeah. Be like, I need to be like, I need support. I need help. And uh, like a lot of us, but like when we get sad, we want to just push it down. Be like, we want to be happy. We want to be happy. Push it down. Push it down. Way down. But be like, when you push emotions down, it doesn't help anything. It just boils back over. So if you allow your emotions to come out, I'm not saying you be controlled by your emotions because if you're controlled by your emotions, be like, you don't know what the, your mood's going to change from day to day. So in that regard, uh, I, I enjoy, I enjoy. It's it's hard not to use the the primary words with this, mm-hmm. but it is it is a it is a joy to see a character go through that kind of character emotional arc from being I have to be in control and everybody has to stand aside because I'm going to make everything right. Yeah. To by the end of the film, which was a very gratifying moment where joy went okay you're in control for a moment let's see how this goes and it just it is such a beautiful moment and then it's it is just it is just it is it's wonderful it's a wonderful moment to see a character grow in that kind of span of time and to you are not fully in control mm-hmm. you are not fully in control with everything and yeah, it's 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 a wonderful arc for a character. I just enjoy her journey. That's my number three. My third like is the uh, events in the dream studio. Oh my gosh, yes. Because Joy is just trying to make oh she's gonna get happy and that's gonna wake her up mm-hmm. and it's it's like yeah that since when has that ever happened? Mm-hmm. But uh, they they <laughs> the whole thing was like and she of course the the dream filter comes in and it turns everyone into what they're supposed to look like instead of just, you know, the emotional abstract oh, yeah. look of things, which is great when they're jumping around the dog as the dog on both sides. And it's like, okay, yeah, that's cute. And then they separate out. And I remember my thinking, 
What does that look like? <laughs> that's that's a horror. Can you show that on in a movie for kids? Three seconds later, they showed that in a movie for kids. It just looks like they cut a hot dog in half. Yeah, <laughs> it's just like that works. That works perfectly. Mm, it works. And then jangles the clown show. Oh up. my it's gosh! Like, yes, Curse that wakes. <laughs> that's gonna wake her up. It's her worst nightmare. Yes. <laughs> But then all the other little things, like how they were showing, especially like when they're going into the the house mm-hmm. at that one point, and the dead rat uh, comes up and says, "Come live with me, Riley." Oh, that was great. <laughs> that was so good. Those things are not supposed to be like it, no. It's almost like things, something you wouldn't think about because you eventually do forget these things in reality. Yeah. But watching that was like, oh, that is funny. It's just abstract enough that it doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I follow the train. Tra- mm-hmm. Pardon the pun. I followed the train of thought. Bum, bum, bum. So, yeah, that's my uh, third like was. Yes. Dream Studio. Yeah. So uh, dislikes. Dislikes. What's your uh, first dislike? My first dislike is this film. I started this as my third like. So we started as my first dislike. Joy's misguided effort. So there again, you have Joy, who is the primary emotion. She's the first emotion. And there again, she has to be in control. She's the control freak. She has to be in control. Riley cannot be sad. She cannot be angry. She has to be all of this. So everything has to be controlled. And at points, it gets a bit, a bit annoying, a bit overwhelming in a lot of ways, where Joy, be like, even to the other emotions, be like, if you're not sadness or joy, you're just trying to copy everybody else's emotion that, yeah. you know, those two emotions, because it'd be like, if you're not those two emotions, it's like, you're, you're not really that important unless you just, you're the comedic timing of angry. And it's it like, it gets a bit uh, daunting. It's a little daunting when it comes to like, because Everything doesn't have to be happy, as we all know this. It just it's it gets a little tiresome. It's a little tiresome from here to there. The joy is trying to fix everything, trying to fix everything. And there again, she's the lead emotion. I get it, but it's more of a nitpick than anything that that our other emotions aren't really being emotions are trying to be their emotions. They're trying to be joy or sadness at some point. Yeah. And so if we really don't get to see who they are as characters for the most part, except for little glimpses here and there, but they're trying, just trying to copy either joy or sadness in some capacity. And I'd be like, even I think even the trivia at some point, it said that joy as the emotional joy goes through all the other emotions, which mm-hmm. is, Kind of weird, but it's interesting. So that's my first dislike. My first dislike for this film in the scene where uh, Joy is trying to find where sadness has gone, and she's saying, "If I were sadness, what uh, what would I be doing right now?" Mm-hmm. And she starts acting like sadness, and then she, she finally, as she's you know laying on her back, waiting to be dragged somewhere, sees that all the orbs are being turned turn blue, blue on the bottom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My problem is none of those orbs were blue before she noticed them. If you look in the shots yeah, before that, they're not blue to before that point, And yet she's not on screen. So what happened there? <laughs> and granted, that's more animation error than anything else. Right. But as like, as that was a weird there, there should have been more visual clue to us which way to go, and that Joy was just not seeing it. Except yeah, it's just not there at all. It's that's really my first dislike is that weird little animation error. Oh, okay, I gotcha. What's your second? My second, like, actually, I saw it on the chat, and I was like, you know what? That's a good point, uh, Art Artsy Steph. <laughs> uh, so I think I know where you're coming from. So if I'm wrong, let me know in the chat. So uh, the the idea that how they want to wake up Riley, even though they know right, be like they know her inside out, pun, pun intended. Like they use her worst fears to wake her up. 
It's not, oh, let's be creative. Let's not try to scare the girl and like scare our best girl because we want her her best interests in mind. No, no, no. Let's just let's you know find a nice plot convenience to be thrown into the the closet where all the, oh. the hideous things are. Okay, I'm gonna have to fight you a touch on this. Yeah, but I'd be like, I, I find it clever in some capacities, but you're using her worst fears against her just for your own benefit to wake up for you can get on the train. I understand it's a plot convenience, but at the same time, you're abusing your parent, you're abusing your own kid, your own girl. So I, I completely get where you're talking about. Oh, okay. So, 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 so let me maybe not correct you, but maybe... Yeah push back a little okay she tried the happy way oh yeah of waking riley up and right. it didn't work they realized that the way to scare some somebody yeah not scare, but a way to forcibly wake somebody up yeah is a nightmare so they get a hat now admittedly they happen to find her worst fears yeah not too far from dream studio yeah. but to some degree that kind of makes sense and who's to say that there's not interests mm -hmm. to that uh, yeah. subconscious all around that thing? They just have that just have to be the one they're close to. Yeah. And that's the one that happened to get Bing Bong because Bing Bong was crying candy tears, mm -hmm. like, which makes sense. Right. And of course, the clown followed that and the clown fell asleep after he threw Bing Bong in a Bing, Bing, Bing Bong mm -hmm. in a balloon jail, which I thought was funny. Uh, <laughs> I. It was a good way to handle that trope. So Bing Bong's awake or he's right there. If there's anything that's going to wake up Riley. Yeah. It's Jangles the clown. I, I'm I'm fully aware of this. Yes. But I, I think and she tried it the other way and realized that's not going to work. And she had to go with Sadness's plan, which was scare her awake. Hmm. Yeah. Agreed. I'm Agreed. not saying you're wrong. No, right? no, yeah. But there's like, what else did you expect them to do to wake her up? Yeah, true. But I just, I, I found it more of like a, a plot convenience where it was like, oh, they just wind up getting themselves thrown in there. And the convenience is like, oh, there's okay. Jango the clown. Getting into there where, where they where the guards, which ironically yeah. were uh, uh, Dave Goals and uh, oh, what's his name? They're two Muppet actors. Oh, okay. Uh, plays Yoda as a director now. Oh, um, Frank Oz. Frank Oz. It's Frank Oz and Dave Goals, aka Miss Piggy and Gonzo. Really? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's wow. who those two people were. Wow. They are because Dave Goals is playing guard uh, Frank, mm -hmm. and Frank Oz is playing guard Dave. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. And that so is, they I'm... see them saying they go. Hey, you're not supposed to get out of here. Get back in there. Get back in. Yeah, admittedly, mm -hmm. that is convenient. It is convenient. They're able to get in there. I, but frankly, it's at that point, it's like we don't need them trying to sneak in past other guards. Just let them get in there. Yeah. Ah, right, that's just me. Yeah, I understand it. It bugs you, but it doesn't bug me at all. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I I found this a little bit of a plot convenience. But be like, it makes sense why they did it, but it's a little more of a plot convenience to me. But, but if they're you write your way to the plot convenience. Is it really plot convenience yeah. or anyway? Yeah. You, you, write, know, we got, we got there without it standing out to me other than, oh, that was convenient. Yeah. That is Just, true. But I can also logic my way around it where it's not a big deal. That is true. By the way, I do, I'll be like, your, your explanation, uh, mm -hmm. artsy stuff. Yes. Totally get it. Yes. So, yes, that is my second dislike. My second dislike. Why did we have to kill Bing Bong? <laughs> Look, Bing Bong. I get it. I get it. He's an imaginary friend. He's supposed to be forgotten. Yeah. And she is at the age where if you suddenly had an imaginary friend that you remembered... And you stalk start talking to them, they would think you're a little cuckoo for cocoa puffs. A little. Just yes. a little. Just a little. So I, I get it. 
but and admittedly it's a very well written scene mm-hmm. agree uh, the way they handle it because you see the look on you can just see bing bong's brain working mm-hmm. and it's like oh i know what he's gonna have to do because mm-hmm. it's not working with him there and he's gonna have to he's being a counterweight oh, okay but at the same time going why'd you kill bing bong <laughs> He was great. You could have found a place to hide him in Imagination Land there with uh, w- a guy who's supposed to be the, uh, uh, Edward from from Twilight. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I'm sorry. That's who I immediately I, thought I, of. I totally when get I it. Saw, it Riley, saw, Riley. saw the imaginary boyfriend. Is like, oh, that's hilarious. Die for Riley. <laughs> yes, but would she die for you? Mm-hmm. Edward, and go, terrible character. Yeah, but that's who I immediately saw. Yeah, understood. I saw like, Completely understand. I, I think even there's a, there's a reference at the very end of the film where it's like, oh, that's you know, Vampire Town or whatever. You know, tw- obviously of Twilight reference, but right. that I totally get. But it's like you could have found a way to keep him around. I mean, maybe Riley gets nostalgic for her childhood and she remembers Bing Bong. She doesn't talk to him because she's not crazy, but yeah, yeah, yeah it's. It's it's part it's of her, fun part childhood of memories. memories. Yeah, you could have done that without killing him completely. Yeah, I mean, do you remember Bing Bong after he goes? Is he still hanging out in her memory vault? The the memories right. of Bing Bong. Right. right, are they still right. in the memory vault? Mm. That's not explained. No, it's not. But anyway, yeah, it's That's just a- like you killed Bing Bong. Yeah, why'd you kill Bing Bong? Are you trying to kill us? You're trying to make it sad. <laughs> yes. And you are trying to make they it did. sad. They did. They did an excellent point. job with that. Because they had to have, uh, they actually had to have Joy not just feel the sadness that she felt down in the memory dump. She had to be kicked in the butt after it. Mm-hmm. So it's like, she, where it's like, you get it now, Joy? You get it now? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, so yeah, they killed the Bing Bong. Why did yeah. you kill Bing Bong? That's yeah. my second dislike. What's your third? My my third dislike would be the so most of us remember our childhood. We don't remember everything in our childhood. So in the movie, they kind of explain it away. It's like they mm-hmm. kind of just dump all this excess memory to for you know to store more memory. Yes. And my thought was, was like, okay, but you're deleting like really hard, like hardcore memories just because they're faded. But and they don't matter to her anymore. Apparently, how, they how don't many matter. Important memories have you had that you've forgotten and don't even realize? Hmm, that's a good point. Mm-hmm. That is a good point. But it's but in some small ways, be like you still do remember them, but you just don't be like it's just kind of fuzzy. They don't get rid of all of the faded memories. It looks like they're getting rid of pretty much the worst ones. They're not the worst ones, but the the most faded. Like, yeah. The ones they talk about, it's like, okay, U.S. presidents, remember George and remember Abe, let everyone else go. Yeah. And then, and what was the other one? The the p- pink pony princess? I don't phone, know numbers. phone numbers. Phone numbers. Phone one numbers was yeah. one of them. Uh. But yeah, those are things that we forget all the time. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I so agree. It makes sense if she's not yeah. using oh, yeah, them. Oh, yeah, I agree. Faded, she's not actively call, calling them back up. So yeah. they're not, you know, refreshing. Yeah. Uh, does kind of mean the triple mint gum one needs to be like constantly bright. Because yeah, exactly. Because it's constantly just all the time. Called. So yeah, but like we have these core memories we remember as kids. Right. And those little memories we have very vague memories of. And like, yeah, it'd be like, you're going to have memories you just no longer remember, but your parents, obviously, your <coughs> relatives or friends are going to remember that you did this, but you just have no memory of it. But it's just like, there, there was a small part of me when they went into be like, oh, we just start deleting everything from her, like very early childhood. And you have sad, be like, not sadness. We, like, at that point. Uh, joy had become sadness. She's just grieving mm-hmm. her grieving the loss of memory. And uh, that broke me in some capacity, but I, just, it, it was almost like they're just dumping all of her Riley's earliest childhood memories for just, you know, be like, 
be like, oh, we're going to bring another sad moment. <laughs> but, I mean, you don't remember what you things were like when you were two years old. That is true. That is true. I'd be like, it's, it's a good point. I agree. It's a good point. Just putting all that out. Yeah, that's true. And plus, I was kind of grabbing at straws for the last one. Let's just say that. That's fair. <laughs> that's very fair. Mm-hmm. My third dislike is, and this is so much a net pick. Why don't we see representations of memories in the father's or mother's mind? And we do get at least see the hot Brazilian co-pilot yes. memory, <laughs> but we never see like on Riley's they're making up like the back wall so they can pull them up at any yeah. time. Mm-hmm. And then they dump them into long-term memory. Yeah. Uh, but we don't see anything like that in the father or mother's memories. That's true. My question is why? Wait, we, we don't know that we don't get to see their personality islands. And I'm not mm-hmm. saying they need to like point them out. It's like, Oh yeah, yeah this is the mother's person. Yeah. Like, you're showing me a, a, a group picture of them at the console why can't I see out the back window and get an idea of like a, see like a family Island or a Riley Island yeah. for the mother. I could see that easy. Yeah. And, uh, dads will just be hockey, <laughs> hockey. And probably, uh, uh, the love for his wife, the love, the love for his, for his wife, wife and yeah. daughter, Little things like that. Yeah. Show me that stuff in the backgrounds. Give me some more. The thing is, this yeah, movie exactly. is so good about backgrounds. Yeah. That when it doesn't do something with the backgrounds, it's like, yeah. Why didn't you do something there? <laughs> At least like, like this little glimpse of maybe yeah. in the corner, you can see something, but they I, don't I, be like, I it's, don't it's, need it's, a, like super, super complex back there. Mm-hmm. But it's like, let me see something in the distance, like mm-hmm. through a window. You don't even have to have it like sharp resolution. You can keep it fuzzy and out of focus. So I can just like, figure, Oh, that there's, there's, I could see one of mom's uh, personality islands just, Mm-hmm. Out there in the distance. Yeah. Can't tell what it is, but it's there. Sure. Give me something like that. Yeah. Agreed. But there, I, I can see where, from a writing standpoint and a, a, a writing standpoint, an artistic standpoint, you want to keep everything on Riley. Be like everything about yes. her, her emotions. That's why I'm saying don't like point it out. I'm just saying yeah. if you know, give her us some, mind is give like us some that, detail. Her, if her mind is like that. Yeah. To some degree, since she is related by blood to both of her parents, mm-hmm. there should be at least some similar architecture, I guess, True. is the best word I'm looking for. It. True. So, I mean, I'm still assuming there should be a window on the back wall where they could see, where the emotions could see the personality islands. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Even so, if we can't make out what those personality islands are. Okay. I want to see that they're there. Yeah. But maybe it's just not important, and there was a good thought process in there. I mean, mom's admittedly mom's uh, mind looked like the set of the View, and dad's mind looked like the set of ESPN. <laughs> yes, I agree. So maybe I should just let it go. But <laughs> that was good. That was good. We need to rate this thing. Yes, we do. What are you rating it? What are you rating it? I'm curious. You would <laughs> uh, I am actually going with eight point five. This is a very cleverly. A designed film. It's mm-hmm. a fun one to watch. It may not be one I go back to regularly just yeah. because I don't really connect with the characters. Okay. Myself. Fair. Fair. But uh, I can appreciate what they were doing, the type of story they were telling. Uh, and then, of course, the animation, because the animation is very good in this. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, I give it an 8.5. Okay. I give this movie a nine. It's well done, like story wise, Mm -hmm. uh, beautifully designed, like the way they design the, uh, the imagination in the world of Riley's mind. It is just so well crafted and well designed. The, the emotional uh, spectrum is all over the place. I enjoy it Uh, from a psychological standpoint. It's done very well. You, you like you understand where they're going with like everything that's going on and uh, the journey in which our characters go is just the emotional roller coaster. And it's great. Like you see Riley 
like from her, you know, her adolescence into her preteen years. And you see that emotional spectrum, which is done very well. And uh, I wish and pray that Disney would, or Disney Pixar would go back to that and mm-hmm. do in depth, beautiful stories like this. Um, I just don't see it in the near future. Um, unless like, you know, this, um, I don't know. What is the next Pixar film coming out? I don't remember. He's out of Disney's Ele- wish. Elemental, Elemental just came out. Just came out. Let me look. And I don't know if that did very well because right now all the Disney movies aren't Disney movies and their affiliates are not doing well. Yeah, bear in mind, there's a writer's strike going on right now. That is so true. anything I am about to say mm-hmm. is up in the air in terms of actual release. Right, things, right, right. I can right. kind of give you an idea as to what's yeah. next. If I can click the yeah, right button wish, on here. Wish is the one that's coming from Disney. I know yeah, that. Yeah, it's Disney. Yeah. But most of those lines should be finished. Yeah, that was uh, finished. Uh, and it's currently scheduled that Elio is yeah. supposed to come out March 1st, 2024. Yeah. yeah. And Inside Out 2 is also scheduled next year for June 14th. Yeah. But writer strike could screw an actor strike mm-hmm. could mess all that up. That so. is true. We shall Bear see. that all in mind. Exactly. Uh, join us on the other side of the break, and we will get to talking about... Uh, what we've been watching, some stuff in the news, and talk about some X Men. Mm-hmm. Oh, what are we? Do- what are we? Uh, what are oh, what's the next movie we're doing? Looking at re- uh, doing a plus review next week on Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer. Mm-hmm. Movie that's currently in theaters. Yes. So yeah, we're doing a new one next week. Mm-hmm. So join us for that. That. This podcast is a proud member of Culture Box. Whether you enjoy geeky reviews, comedy, or original fiction, you can open up the Culture Box and find something excellent for your soul. Point your web browser to culturebox.media. This week, we suggest the Retro Rewind Podcast. Every other week, join the Retro Rewind Pod as they travel back 15 years or more along the entertainment space-time continuum in their mission to review movies and games establishing what is still worth your time today and what isn't. Expect fun banter and trivial insights from Francisco, Paul, the master interrupter powers, and a rotating cast of guest hosts, all of which are out of time. You're welcome, Roy, for being on the so Disney episode. I'd like to thank the following patrons, Ashley and Francisco Ruiz, Book of Gaming, PaulJPowers.com, and Melanie Dubois. And apparently I'm lazy because I keep forgetting to take this off. Plus uncut episodes, early access to the Cellcast Plus reviews, and special art from Jacob. Please donate to us on Patreon. So, Jacob, I've got a question for you, my friend. What have you been watching? What have I been watching? So, uh, a lot of YouTube, actually. Uh, so, while I was, I, I'm a little bit ahead in X-Men, the animated series in season three. I'm a little bit ahead because surprise, surprise, you just keep watching it. And uh, so it's like, you know what? Be like, I've already watched the episodes we are reviewing. So why not find something else? And so I was like, wait a minute. I've had gargles on the brain for like the last, like most of the day. Cause something came out of San Diego comic-con. I was like, Oh my gosh. <laughs> so yeah, I'll talk about that in a minute, but it reminded me of another show that came out in the 1990s, part of uh, Disney Afternoons, also known as Gargoyles. So I started watching Gargoyles back in the day when it came out, and I rewatched it a couple of, like, a year ago or so. And you know what? Be like, I remember, I'll be like, I love that first season. It's amazing story wise, animation wise, character development, character growth. It's so well done. And if you've never seen Gargoyles, it's on Disney Plus. If you subscribe to Disney Plus, go watch it. It's worth it's worth watching. Uh, it's might be a little dated for our you know our modern audience because they use a flip phone at some point. And uh, but it's an amazing show. Go watch it. Um, and plus, uh, Dave, what is it, David Keith? I'm saying yeah, David Keith. Yeah, David Keith is the voice of Goliath, and that's that man has an amazing voice. <laughs> Like the 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 line in which uh, like you hear him just roar it if I'm gonna say it right, 
it's to be like I have been denied everything, even my revenge. I was like, oh my, I'll, I'll, like, that's amazing line. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, yes. Uh, you say little... all that and you don't, you fail to mention that Jonathan Frakes and Marita Sirtis yeah. are playing evil lovers. I, I was going to get evil them. Evil Ryder and Troy. It's hilarious. Yes. For me anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because that'd be like if, if you. I'm just waiting for for evil Riker up there to call the, the female gargoyle Mzadi, and you don't even know what that. Means. No, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Betazoid for beloved. That's <laughs> what Riker always calls Troy. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> anyway. Mm, all right. Continue. We're still on your section. No, I'm good. I'm done. I'm done. You're done? I, I'm just. I'm not like the 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 depth of nerdiness you are in Star Trek. It's funny. It's it's great, and it's just funny as all out. So yeah, no 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 shade there. I just thought it was great. <laughs> really, this is the game we're gonna be playing. <laughs> hey, I'm not throwing shade. I thought it was just funny. So all you've watched is gargoyles. Yeah, that's all. And a lot of, of YouTube. And a lot of YouTube. Yeah. Unless I'm completely forgetting Not something. that I know of. Yeah. Because uh, I don't know what you've been watching. We don't hang I, out I, that I, much. I, I would hope so. They just don't know what I, what I watch. Uh, no, I have been. Well, since we have a month and ten days ish until ahsoka comes out on disney plus yeah i and it's looking very much like star wars rebels season five i am plowing through star wars rebels <laughs> i am about halfway through season one yeah uh it's a good show i actually do suggest it and if especially if you want to catch up on ahsoka before, mm -hmm. before ahsoka before then yeah. you can pretty much jump in there there's a couple things you might need to know about ahead of time but mm -hmm. uh but yeah, you can kind of just jump in there and just have a ball with with the crew of the ghost. Uh, but yeah, that's I have been watching that, and of course I watched the new episode of Star Star Trek: Strange New Worlds. That was a good one. Nick, oh, I'll get I wait for the news for that. Uh, other than that, that's pretty much all I've had a chance to watch. Gotcha. So, what do we have in the news? The Cellcast News with your host, Jacob Heron. Ah, why? Thank you, Dealit. So... San Diego Comic Con is happening right now uh -huh. in San Diego. Uh -huh. So for animation guys like us, it's like, oh my gosh, we're gonna get a ton of stuff. We hope, um, we hope, and we already have. So uh, going into it, uh, apparently, uh, Ryan Reynolds, famous actor, Deadpool, what have you, uh, apparently is trying to revive a certain TV show, a cartoon from the 1990s something i remember watching it was cool some about mice on bikes why <laughs> all right so let me read the article why because <laughs> it's cool nostalgia okay why We're biker <laughs> mice from mars <laughs> because it's funny and cool. It's biker mice from Mars. And your point? It's one step above uh, tattooed teenage alien fighters from Beverly Hills. Ow! No! No, 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 no. Danger mice? Danger mouse was a thing. Danger mouse. I'm sorry. Danger mouse, yes. Uh, so let me read the article. But, yes, biker mice from Mars was awesome for a 90s kid. Now, Granted, you watch them nowadays, it's like, whoa, okay, that's a bit weird. But Biker Mars from Mars is really cool. I enjoy it. I, I know Drew 
doesn't real apparently really like Michael Martin. SWAT Cats was better. <laughs> oh, I agree. I completely agree. Yes. <laughs> SWAT Cats need to eat the biker mice from Mars. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's so funny. Like we we need a biker. We need a uh, SWAT Cats TV show again, please. Thank you very much. Someone do it for us. Thank you. We'd be all appreciated. All right, so going to the article itself, another 90s cartoon classic is revving up bonk, 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 uh, to burn rubber. It, we're going to get these puns throughout this entire article, people. Now it sounds like you're trying to describe Power Rangers Turbo. <laughs> Apparently, we don't talk about Turbo in some, some shows. Oh, we talked about it. Yeah, yeah we apparently. ran that thing into the ground. <laughs> if that episode so of you, Power Trip come ever comes out, which I will publish, I will uh, post links when it does. That's going to be a trip to listen to. So you rode the tires off of it. I'm not going to go too much into it because that would be spoiling. Yes. All right. So uh, burning rubber into the. Uh, a screen revival. <laughs> Sorry, Drew. With uh, the news that actor, producer, and motorcycle motorcyclist enthusiast Ryan Reynolds from Deadpool films, Free Guy, and the, the upcoming, I didn't know this, this is going to be interesting if it happens. Dragon's Lair, the movie. You know Dragon's about? Lair? Dragon's Lair. The movie that's been in production for 10 years. Something like that. Because he can't, because, because, um, what's his Don name? Don Bluth. Don Bluth can't get funding. <laughs> that's true. He's always had problem funding with anything. But, um, I nearly said Ralph Bakshi. Okay. <laughs> okay. Fair <laughs> enough. I know it's not Ralph Bakshi. Fair. Okay. Uh, so apparently he signed to be a, a co producer with, um, uh, Nestle Company's reboot of Microvice from Mars. This latest take on the sci-fi action tune is also being co-produced by television streaming service Fubu. Fubu. Fubi. Fubi. Fubu. 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 Yeah, Fubi. Fubo. Fubo. That's it. Fubu. No, I think it's Fubo, but I was thinking it's Fubu. (laughs) Right. Sounds like a Fubar. (laughs) All right. So uh, today. During the official um, Star Trek, the animated celebration panel at San Diego Comic-Con going on in, obviously, San Diego, California. Uh, fans receive a sneak peek into the year's salute into the 50th anniversary of Star Trek's first folly into animation, Star Trek, the anima- animated series. Um so it appears that CBS Studios is creating five all new animated promotional spots in the style of the Star Trek animated uh, animated series featuring fan favorite characters voiced by cast members from across the Star Trek universe, including Jonathan Franks, Doug Walker or Doug Jones mm-hmm. and Amon Sherman. Armin Shimmerman. Armin Shimmerman. Thank you. Armin Sh- Armin. Armin Shimmerman. Shimmerman. Yeah, Armin Shimmerman. Thank you. Uh, so, AKA, you just said Riker, Saru, and Quark. Quark. Someone knows their Star Trek. I've been watching it since I was five. That is true. That is true. So, it is my earliest memory coming home from church and watching Star Trek. Fair Give enough. me a break. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. So, um, I, I saw a bit like there again, going back to our childhood, because apparently the 90s and late like 80s are so nostalgic for everybody. Definitely people our age. Mm-hmm. So uh, Max is bringing back another show, which I remember fun memories of, but it's just it's an updated version of it. So during the San Diego Comic-Con or as the article starts, us. Cartoon class is in session. Neither too neat. Exactly. All a little loony. And in this cartoon. So today at the com- uh, San Diego Comic Con, uh, Tiny Toons University released an official theme song to its upcoming animated series, 
in which debuts in this fall on Cartoon Networks and on Max. The new the new theme composed by Matthew Jesrin. Probably pronounced pronounce that wrong. Uh, who, has, who has done many things. Uh, strikes and Nostalgia Chord uh, by showcase, uh, showcasing Bruce Botman's. I'm going to put an iconic theme from the uh, uh, Tiny Tune Adventure, uh, which you can hear Drew singing the entire time. Because it's like Riley's, you know, the, 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 the gum theme in your head. You just can't get rid of it. Tiny Tune Adventure's coming. So, yes, I, I, I do plan on putting... the one from 91. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, this this one is 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 a slight update. Slight because, difference. Yeah, because apparently they are no longer in high school, but in college. Uh, so they were going to Acme University either way. That is true. So, and apparently, what is it? Not Bugs. What's the uh, uh, Abs and Buster Bunny? Buster. Apparently, Buster and uh, Plucky are roommates. That's going to be interesting. <laughs> well, you couldn't have had him and Babs. Yeah, because no, that would just be no. Because they have no relations. No, they don't. Definitely not. All right. So, um, oh my gosh. So. So, uh, going back to the 80s this time, and I know a show I watched, Drew sure wasn't allowed to watch for some bizarre reason, but there we go. Girls, teenage in advance, in, in advance of Paramount Pictures releasing the brand new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem to theaters, exclusive theaters on April 2nd. If you want to go watch it, go watch it. Is, it sounds interesting. I'm pretty sure we're going to do a reaction to it at some point. But um, uh, Nickelodeon announced the acquirement of the original Frank uh, Fred Wolf Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles animated series um, from 1987 to 1996. The news is shared during today's panel for the upcoming film at the San Diego Comic Con. And with that, uh, so the the whole reason I brought up, um, wow, I am terrible with names. One moment, please. Thank you, Mikey Raff. No, 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 no. no. Uh, Kit, uh, Keith Davis, who voiced David, yeah, yeah, Keith David, who voiced Goliath. I wish they were bringing back, you know, uh, gargoyles. That'd be amazing, but they're not. What? Keith David is doing though they revealed during I think it was during uh, a He-Man panel at San Diego Comic Con they haven't shown trailers or anything yet but for the upcoming Masters of Universe Revolution that's, exactly <laughs> so apparently Keith David know. Keith David did you watch that show? No. Okay. Well, never mind. I didn't watch He Man. Okay. Not for long, anyway. That's true. I can totally get it. But Keith David is voicing Hordak. I'm like, ha! Ah! <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Because <laughs> that iconic voice as a villain is always good. So, yes, bring it. <laughs> so, yeah, that's all I have for the news. And let's drew us something I don't know about. One were... minor thing. If you are listening to us live next Thursday, which is what? That's a good question. What is Thursday next, next week? July 27th. Hmm. If you are, if you have, if uh, you enjoy Star Trek Lower Decks, that is when the crossover episode with Strange oh. New Worlds is airing. It is going to be an episode titled Those Old Scientists. Oh. Hmm. In reference to what... Um, I can't remember character names now. The first officer always referred to the... Because uh, he called he calls it the TOS era when during Kirk's time. Mm -hmm. Of course, we call it TOS era because that stands for... The original the series. series. Yes. He says it stands for those old scientists. Mm. And it is that time period. So, yeah. Yes. And they released a clip as a part of this week's Ready Room, uh, which is their, like, uh, after show, basically, mm -hmm. for for, for uh, Star Trek. They showed a clip from next week with uh, 
Boimler in sick bay with uh, Anson Mount and, uh, you know, his Pike and mm-hmm. um, Una standing over him. Uh, that's number one. Okay. That doesn't tell you much. No, it doesn't. Any of these characters are. No, I don't. <laughs> I know who Anson Mount as Pike is. Yes. Uh, and there's even a portrait says, here, you might want this back. You don't want to, uh, to pollute the timeline any. And Boimler recognizes uh, Una and, and gets spooked and runs off. And she goes, you don't think he knows something about my future, does he? I'm thinking, no, that's just Boimler. <laughs> he thinks you're cute, Una. <laughs> and then he runs scared. <laughs> That'll be interesting to see. He does have purple hair. Wow. He does have purple wow, hair. Wow, that is good. That is good. I'm just going to say. Dyed purple hair. Wow. I'm dark, it's a dark purple, but. Yes. I'm, I'm just going to say this. Be like, yes, you are correct, Roy. I have already decided whenever we get back to Lower Decks, mm-hmm. we're probably starting off with this Strange New Worlds episode. Yeah. So whenever that occurs, keep an eye out for that. Yeah. I do I do have an idea, but we'll talk about it after the show is ended. Okay. So the next time the internet hiccups. Maybe. Hopefully Maybe. hopefully it doesn't this time. But before it does that, mm-hmm. why don't we talk about some X-Men? Previously on X-Men. I know how to be superhero. And electrically transistored superhero. And exotically erotic and erotic superhero. The Marvel superheroes have arrived. X Men, X Men, it's today, it's today. X Men, X Men, come to your way. Spider-Man and his amazing friends, Iceman and Firestar. Green Hulk is here, Dr. Doom is up in tears, when Iron Man joins the fight. But as soon as he describes, but as soon as he describes, Horus Hammer has fun. Hunger's might? Hunger's might? Who'll save that day? The superhero squad. I tried. He tried. It was good. It was a good attempt. Oh, Jiminy Cricket's on a pogo stick. Uh, uh, agreed. X-Men. Season four. We're finally really getting into it, even though we technically started last time. Sanctuary parts one and two originally aired December 21st, 1995 and that's no, sorry, October 21st, 95 and October 28th, 95 respectively. These episodes were directed by Larry Houston and Fred Miller and written by Stephen Melching and Jeff Saylor respectively. Weary of battling mutant supremacy. Offer to transport all mutants to an orbiting asteroid named Asteroid M, where they can live peaceful and human-free lives. As Magneto plummets helplessly to Earth, Fabian Cortez assumes control of Asteroid N and sends hundreds of missiles towards Earth. Getting into the cast for this, we have Len Carlson reprising his role as President Robert Kelly, a U.S. delegate, and Marco Delgado. David Fox as the Sentinels. Jeffrey Max Nichols as Fabian Cortez. Uh, Susan Roman as Amelia Vogt, James Blendick as Apocalypse, Paul Haydad as Byron Kelly, Dave Hennessy as Chrome, Ellen at Ray Hennessy as Carmela Unisclone, and of course, David Hemblin as Magneto. I am Magneto, Master of Magnet. 
<laughs> you... I'm sorry, I've missed Magneto uh, on this show. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> and he doesn't do a lot in this, these two episodes. No, but he's a character at least. It's true. Uh, getting into the trivia for this one. Uh, together, Sanctuary Parts 1 and 2 are a very loose adaptation very of loose. the Mutant Genesis storyline from X-Men Volume 2, Issues 1 through 3 of the Jim Lee, Chris Claremont mm-hmm. era of X-Men Comics, Volume 2, 1991. Yeah. In this episode, we get the debut of Acolytes, Magneto's followers on Asteroid M, which are Fabian Cortez, Amelia Vogt, Marco Delgado, Joanna Cargill, and Fr- Frenzy. Chrome and Carmelo Unicione and Byron Kelly slash Burner. We get cameos from Doc Sampson while Gambit is scrolling through a list of, of missing scientists. We get cameos from X Factor, mm-hmm. aka Havoc, Polaris, Strong Guy, that is literally the name they listed, mm-hmm. Quicksilver, Wolf Spain, and Forge. Gideon and Haven are all seen as Cortez addresses the people of Earth. And this is my favorite listing of cameo because apparently they couldn't tell which of these two characters it was supposed to be. It's either Black Panther or Moon Knight. Oh, it was Black Panther. That was Black Panther. That was Black Panther. Come on. I can tell you that was Black Panther. They landed in Wakanda. Let's be honest. Uh, In this episode, Professor Xavier wears his purple and silver Shi'ar exoskeleton, which allows him to walk. This suit was first seen in the comics during Fatal Attraction's crossover event. However, in this episode, Xavier's not seen walking at all in this episode. Lastly, Deathbird, sister of Deken and Lalandra, mm-hmm. is seen alongside Apocalypse when he addresses Cortez, indicating that she has allied herself with Apocalypse. This is a weird two couple of episodes. Uh, yes, it is. It's a, a bad couple episodes. It's it's just this feels very odd odd is the best way i know how to put it it's, it's like after they finished uh uh the, the, the dark phoenix saga mm-hmm. they just decided oh we need a season opener let's do that thing we were gonna uh, that uh pride of the x-men was gonna be based on except different and it is different yes very uh at least as i can a decent plot line through this true but at the same time i'm going why are any of you listening to fabian cortez about any of this the man is a liar you can tell that from when he first shows up Mm -hmm. uh what are your thoughts oh my gosh this these two episodes were so funky it was i was like okay magneto shows up be like oh we got sanctuary yeah, we really kind of messed this up. Not we did putting uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame <laughs> with this ep- pairing it with these episodes. I agreed. Which is ironic because both of those are my picks. Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> Actually, I know why I didn't think of that, and it's because the movie lists and the TV thing went up and down as I was trying to figure oh, something out. Okay, I got that's you. why they didn't line up. Not because I didn't think of it at all until tonight. Okay. Anyway, so be like it's interesting, but like Magneto finally shows back up and does something. Finally, thank you very much. Uh-huh. Um, but his role is so it's more like oh, we get all these mutants to go up to this this uh you know space uh space station asteroid asteroid M. That's asteroid. But M. I'm it's sorry, asteroid M. Yeah, technically, I would classify it as a space station in terms yeah. of structure. True, but they it is asteroid M. It is an a- asteroid M. Space station Which apparently stands for mutant, not for Magneto. Magneto. Yeah, the master of magnet. Mag- oh, oh, sorry. Gonna play that clip to death. <laughs> Because we may we may not get another episode where Magneto is in it. Yeah, he may. Well, you know, I'll find a way to play this. For this oh yeah, absolutely, time. absolutely. But like, yeah, this this episode is like it's decent. These two episodes are decent. Uh, the animation is okay. the The story is oh, Magneto shows up. Oh, he's going to bring all these mutants over to uh, Asteroid M. And oh yeah, that's not going to cause problems <laughs> like it normally does. Magneto, come on, think it through a little better. Especially when you go and attack Genosha. Yeah, true. You didn't. An- another you mutant that was sanctuary. 
sanctuary. That's not a sanctuary. That's a slave pit. Oh, never mind. As we know that is true. But they're claiming they're a sanctuary in this episode. Yes, which we know they're not. We hate. We we do not like the use of the word uh, sl- slave. They the we we are just uh, keeping. We're just managing mutant powers like we would any other resource. The peop- the citizens of a free, a free Genosha, the mutant citizens of free Genosha are not slaves. They are free. And going, yeah, right. Are they free, are they free to free to, to leave Genosha? I don't think so. They're not even allowed to wear different clothes. Apparently. <laughs> But it's like this, this, these two episodes, I mean, like, yeah, you have this character who betrays Magneto, master of magnetism, and it's just like, you could not see this coming a mile away. And everybody's convinced like, oh, they like the X-Men destroy Magneto, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to become a dictator, of, um, asteroid M and blah, 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 blah. It's like, you don't like, you wouldn't think that Magneto is not going to come back because obviously he's going to come back. Mm-hmm. but it's just it's oh my gosh i think it's just so cliche uh, like, I, I will say i, I, I don't even remember a heart, half the episode i will say i appreciate that magneto is actually having to deal with his people yeah i agree because that's who magneto was he's the terrorist mm-hmm. bent on forcibly uh putting mutants you know on top it's how he's generally depicted yeah and now he's having to face the people who are pretty much him when they go, wait, there are humans aboard the space station. Oh yeah. Yeah. The prejudice. Yeah, we're not monsters guys. Yeah. And it's like, I don't care. I, I hate all humans. Kill the humans. They're just astronauts. It's like, yeah. And newsflash, cosmonauts, you're human too. You bozo. They technically they're cosmonauts, but That's sure. True. And they're probably smarter than you because they are cosmonauts. <laughs> That just means they're Russian astronauts, but still. Mm. So, the, the, so they drink the good water. <laughs> they know how to crush sparrow egg, but teen man dies. Apparently. Because this is the only way I know how to do this voice. <laughs> um, anyway. Uh, I, these are a fun couple episodes. I, I was thrown off. So, so the internet issues we've kind of been fighting a little bit tonight, they've kind of started earlier in the day and that's why i had gone ahead and reset Mm -hmm. the internet before you came over here and we started because i had to start and stop this second episode of this like three or four times oh to get through because it was just literally starting and something so with the first time i saw wolverine in his cool blue suit i'm going is that an animation error or is that real oh wait it has to be real rogues in a different costume too Mm mm-hmm and then you get to, to uh, Xavier and go, wow, that's a fashion choice. <laughs> uh, the, I like that we introduced some new suits, even though we probably will never see those suits again. Probably. Because <laughs> it would be about part and parcel with every other design change the characters have had in the last three years of the show. Yeah. But... Uh, uh, it, it's it was a, they're they're fun couple episodes. Yeah, when it comes down to agreed. I mean, like I, I I watched this probably like a week ago, mm-hmm. and uh, I just blew through them watching them, and it was like it's serviceable for a story, kind of. But uh, overall, be like I don't have no I have vaguely memories of them. Obviously the the costume designs is like yes we finally get costume de- different designs. Thank you very much. Uh, you get more of this throwback to like, uh, I think it was like uh, X Factor Wolverine, his costume mm-hmm. at some point. I thought that was a cool idea. Um, Rogue's design, I think it's Storm's design. Like, we get different designs for characters, which I like, but the story itself is kind of blase. Right, right. So I think that's pretty much all we have I, to really talk I, about this episode. Because so, and it was for the most part very straightforward. Yeah, it was episode. Straightforward. There's nothing really that stood out as particularly bad, but yeah. it was just a fun little episode. Yeah, agreed. 
next week, along with Oppenheimer, we're going to be reviewing the episodes Xavier Remembers and Courage. Mm -hmm. So join us next week for that. You got anything else before we head out of here? Uh, no, I, I've got, I think, yeah, I got nothing. All right. Join us next week for those things. And in the meantime, oh, one other little thing. If you are live right now, mm -hmm. check the RSS feed tomorrow morning. There will be a new episode for y'all. Very yeah. special new episode that y'all don't even know is coming. So yeah. keep an eye out for that. In the meantime, this has been Drew. This is Jacob. And we'll catch you in the next frame. You can follow Jacob on his Facebook at Jacob B. Heron. His Facebook page, Jacob's Daily Art Corner, where he tries to draw each and every day. His Instagram at Jacob B. Heron. His Twitter at Jacob Heron. And his letterbox to Jacob Heron. You can find Drew on Facebook at Drew Dodgen. His Facebook page, Drew's photo bin to see his photography. His letterbox page at G George 759. His Twitter at G George 759. And Instagram at Drew Dodgen. You can like us on Facebook at the Cellcast Podcast. On Twitch at the Cellcast Gaming. On YouTube at Cellcast. On Twitter at Cast underscore Cell. The Cellcast can be found at Apple Podcasts, Google Play Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or anywhere else fine podcasts are downloaded from. Please rate and review us where you found us, and also on Podchaser. Email us at thecellcastpodcast at gmail.com. The Cellcast is a proud member of both the Pop Americana and Culture Box Media Networks. For more information, please see the link in the description. Our theme song is Drop and Roll by Silent Partner. And remember, that's Cell with a single L. Triple Dent Gum will make you smile. Triple Dent Gum, it lasts a while. Triple Dent Gum will help you, mister, to punch bad breath right in the kisser. Triple Dent Gum. I'm getting such a headache! <laughs>